like commemorate on this great day is some of the work which has helped in some of the areas to make never now. do not to speak fulsomely. Most of that never would have done would have been done without men of Burt Marshall and Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, Chief Justice Warren, Julian Bond, all of those that are here today, Vernon Jordan, just never would have been done. Now, here's what I want to say. That what I have said is precisely the work which we must continue. And this is a whole important part of this meeting, not what we have done, what we can do. So much, so little have we done. It oughtn't to take much place, what we must do. So I think it's time to leave aside the legalisms and euphemisms and the eloquent evasions. It's time we get down to business of trying to stand black and white on level ground. For myself, I believe it's time for all of us in government and out to face up to the challenge. We must review and reevaluate what we've done and what we've done. In specific areas, we must set new goals and new objectives and new standards. Not merely what we can do to try to keep things quiet, but what we must do to make things better. Now, how much time are we given to that in this meeting? How much time are we going to give in the days ahead? How are we going to employ that time? Who's going to bring our groups together and who's going to select that leadership and what's that leadership going to do. Specifically, I believe that we must direct our thought and our effort to many, many fields and I don't have a great staff and little I can contribute in the way of leadership. But if I can leave the thought with those of you who do make up a great staff and who served as my staff. I want to suggest a few little relatively unimportant thoughts as just some of the things to be put on your agenda. Are the federal government and the state government and the foundation and the churches, the universities doing what they can and all that they should to assure enough black scholarships for young blacks in every field? The answer is no, very little. And it gets back to the same thing. Herman Sweat can come to this university now, but as someone said on the panel this morning, Henry Gonzalez, I think, if, he doesn't, what good does it do him sit at the counter and get a cup of coffee if he doesn't have 50 cents to get it? And most of them just don't have it. And that's why they're not here. It's not their mother or their father doesn't want them here. It's not that they don't have an ambition to be here. They just can't do it. And we've got to level out that ground, son. Are our professions such as law and medicine and accounting and engineering and dentistry and architecture taking the initiative? sounding the call to make certain that their educational programs are so planned and so conducted that blacks are being prepared for the leadership courses and are being given the support that they must have if they are to complete the courses and to have genuine opportunities to establish themselves in positions of leadership, professional careers, and things of that matter after their college days. Are our trade unions and all those concerned with vocational occupation doing the same to open up apprenticeships and training programs so that the blacks, the group I spoke of, 
have a fair chance at entering and a fair chance of succeeding in these fields that are so vital to the future of our nation and to our country at this very moment? Are our employers who have already made a start toward opening jobs to the blacks doing what they can and should in order to make certain that blacks qualify for advancement on the promotion ladder and that the promotion ladder itself reaches out for the blacks as it does for the others in our society. What I'm saying is that we cannot take care of the goals to which we've committed ourselves simply by adopting a black star system. It is good and it is heartening and it's satisfying to see individual blacks succeeding as stars in the field of politics and athletics and entertainment and other activities where they have high visibility, such as Clarence Mitchell referred to in his family. And uh, I felt almost as good in my own election, not quite as good, when Barbara and Yvonne were elected this year because I thought that we were moving forward. And I, I enjoyed uh, knowing of those elections about as much as I did my own. But we must not allow the visibility of a few to diminish the efforts to satisfy what is our real responsibility to the still unseen millions who are faced with that basic problem of being black in a white society. So our objective must be to assure that all Americans play by the same rules and all Americans play against the same odds. Who among us would claim that that's true today. I feel this is the first work of any society which aspires to greatness. So let's be on with it. We know there's injustice. We know there's intolerance. We know there's discrimination and hate and suspicion. And we know there's division among us. But there is a larger truth. We have proved that great progress is possible. We know how much still remains to be done. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then, my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. The President has given permission to this gentleman to read a telegram. And a prayer. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, Roy Ennis 
National Chairman of the Congress of Racial Equality, and myself, the Council of Churches, City of New York Task Force on Racism, I sent the following message to the former President of the United States of America this morning. It reads as follows. This symposium is interesting, and the opportunity to honor you and to recall the great strides of the 1960s is worthy and justifiable. However, the hour is late, the needs of the black nation overdue and urgent. Racism under the administration of Richard Nixon has increased. This gathering of great Americans must not leave Austin without an organized, ongoing structure dedicated to reconvening and to combating injustice in America as was done by your administration. Black people still honor your record and commitment to civil rights. To adjourn today makes this symposium no more than an empty ritual honoring one man while the soul and conscience of America must be healed the cancer of racism. For this symposium not to expand and deal with a new definition of equality is to refuse the sun of a new day and prevents a rendezvous with the future. We demand the extension of today's agenda. Respectfully, the Reverend A. Kendall Smith, Council of Churches, City of New York, Task Force on Racism, Roy Ennis, National Chairman, Congress of Racial Equality. And since the President has allowed me to read this telegram, I would ask that Roy Ennis join me here now. Mr. Ennis. Mr. Middleton, as we agreed earlier, behind closed doors, we noted that this symposium did not open with prayer. And we noted that it did not, it has not been scheduled to close with prayer. With your permission, Mr. Newton, I request permission. If this symposium must close now, we demand that it not close. We demand that the agenda be expanded and we demand that the citizens of the United States of America who have come today, the distinguished leaders, Ramsey Clark and so many, Julian Bond, we demand that we have an opportunity, Mr. Middleton, to remain here for a few more hours. And with your permission, I would like to continue, but I do not want to disrespect the chair. I think by all means, anybody who would like to stay should feel perfectly free to, uh, to stay. Many of these people have planes that are scheduled to leave, and uh, the symposium was scheduled to uh, adjourn uh, at noon. I uh, would certainly leave it up to the individual members in the audience. Whoever wanted to stay, by all means, please do. Well, well I'll make the following. Well, Mr. Middleton, in view of the time that we're supposed to expand at uh, 12 o'clock, if the chairman can preside or whoever the body wishes to preside, uh, Roy Ennis and myself offer the following recommendation, that uh, this symposium on civil rights reconvene 30 to 60 days from now in New York City at Columbia University, and number two, that this symposium go on record for supporting Vernon Jordan's are the National Urban League's call for a black summit with President Richard Nixon. Um, well, if we have a recording secretary, I will say uh, it is so recorded. I suggest that you present. <laughs> oh, they're afraid of it.
to just make a brief statement I had made to others last evening and I did not think that it would concern uh, all those who attended here. I have served with many presidents and I think I have a viewpoint that no other person in this room has about the presidency. Out in my little town one time, where court week is very exciting, all the boys would leave town to avoid the grand jury. <laughs> and all the citizens would go to court to hear the proceedings. The town drunk came up to the hotel one morning as the old judge was leaving and said, uh, would you uh, give a poor man a dime for a cup of coffee? And the judge said, hell no, get out of the way. I wouldn't give a tramp anything. And the poor fellow with a hangover, some of you wouldn't understand that. Uh, walked off the porch dejectedly, and just as he got to the end of the porch, the judge said, come back. If you'd like to have a quarter for a pick-me-up, I'd be glad to help you. <laughs> and he handed the old fellow a quarter, and he looked up at him, startled, but with great appreciation in his eyes, and said, Judge, you've been there, haven't you? <laughs> so, uh, when uh, Mr. Ennis asked that uh, he speak to this group or there would be disruption, I told the group to be, not that we feared disruption because I've had it all my life, but uh, I believe that people ought to be free to speak their peace as they see it under circumstances, even if we had not planned it that way. You can't plan for everyone. A great many people were invited here to participate that couldn't come. And uh, no one really knows how thorough we tried to make this and how we tried to include everyone that has a spark of interest, whether it's something I agree with or not. But I said, I think you should speak. And when the Reverend told me he wanted to deliver prayer, uh, we had our own plans, but I said, uh, let's do that. Because the great thing about being an American is that uh, you are inhibited by chains and most of the time by baseball bats and by suppression. Uh, and I think we ought to allow other people the freedom that we reserve for ourselves. But, so we've done that. And that explains what's happened, but, and I'm proud that we have done it. Now, I just want to say this to you, which I said to some leaders last night. It's mighty easy for any group that has suffered as cruelly as most of you have, and as long as you have, to feel an insecurity and a sense of injustice 
that's so compelling at times that uh, you may overlook some other things. But I went to Washington Mr. Hoover's day, and uh, I felt it then because I'd worked for a dollar a day from sunup to sundown. Uh, I saw the bonus marchers driven down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Anacosta Flats, and it troubled me to see the man on the white horse uh, treating them like we handled our own goats and sheep. I saw the days of the Depression when little children had to eat, go to garbage cans and pull grapefruit out and hull it with their teeth because they didn't have food. And I lived through the Roosevelt era and era and the Truman era and the Eisenhower era and the Kennedy era. And I knew all of those men and I knew them reasonably well. And all of them left office wiser than they entered it. But I believe all of them were honorable. And I see this from the perspective of a former president. I believe every man elevated to that high office where he can go no farther wants to do what he thinks is right. And it's a lot easier to want to do what's right than to know what's right. That's the big problem. And some, some presidents, and I speak of myself particularly, had a learning process, and we knew more when we left Washington than when we went there. And some of you men were patient and, and understanding and tolerant of me, as you feel people have not been tolerant of you. And when I stumbled, you helped me, and when I erred, you strengthened me. And I'm not speaking of <clears throat> any political thought in mind. I'm speaking of our future in this country. And I hope that President Nixon and his cabinet, and Speaker Albert, and Senator Mansfield and Scott, Congressman Ford, and the leadership of the House and the Senate. I don't think it's appropriate for the court, except as Clarence suggested this morning in their selection, but it's certainly appropriate with the Congress and with the Cabinet and with the Presidency. For you leaders, and God knows some of the best ones are in this room. I speak from all experience. No one in this room has said more ugly things about me than Clarence Mitchell, and there's no man in this room that I revere and respect his name more, because either he has learned a lot in 40 years, or I have learned a lot. In any event, uh, we finally uh, saw some things that we could do together, and we did them. Now what I want you to do is go back, all of you counsel together like Burke Marshall used to in the Kennedy days and later in the Johnson days, that soft, kind way, just cool, push off wrath, and indulge and tolerate and finally come out with a program, with objectives, with an organization, the Civil Rights Congress or Civil Rights Group, whatever you, I used to meet with 35 of them. And they know, knew more about me when they left than they did when they came, and I knew a lot more about the problems of the world. And uh, I would hope that the outstanding people that you have here and other places of leadership that some foundation or some group would bring you together, that those with experience could lend some wisdom, that you could have a specific small groups selected, 
not only to look at what we've done, I've heard all the programs, how we're going to wipe out our poverty program, how we're going to destroy our education program, what we're going to cripple our medical program, we're going to dilute our, uh, our, our enforcement of a lot of our civil rights program. I hope that's not true. I don't believe it is true. But if it is true, the horsepower is in this room to bring it to the attention of the American people, and they should, and to bring it to the attention of the Congress, and it's their duty, and to bring it to the attention of the Cabinet, and to bring it to the attention of the President himself. I've sat through lots of meetings of an hour or more hearing things I didn't want to hear about myself or my administration. Uh, I can't remember many of them, though, that weren't helpful. And I'm sure that the Cabinet and the Congress and the President, because I know the President uh, wants to do what's right. He doesn't want to leave the presidency feeling that he's been unfair or unjust or uh, unequal to his fellow man. But knowing what's right is important. And I've looked back in retrospect some of the things that I did when I was President. And I wish I'd have known a little more than I did know when I made the decision. Every decision comes to him this way. And he has limited access to groups. And I think it's important that you talk to the speaker and talk to the leadership and talk to the committee men and talk to the groups in the Congress sympathetic with you and talk to the cabinet. Not demanding, not threatening, not putting bombs in or tell them you're going to camp in the restroom. You might have to do that sometime. I had a lot do that with me. I went in the White House shortly after I was there, and they wouldn't let me get upstairs to my room. But I talked to them and listened to them, as I have here this morning, and I, I was better for, for it. I don't think that's the way Clarence Mitchell or Roy Wilkins or Whitney Young or Vernon Jordan or Julian Bond, I don't think they would blow up the Capitol. They weren't hurt. But they can be heard. That's the point. They should be heard. That's the point. So get your priorities. See that what we've done, we don't lose. Then see how we're going to get black credit in this country. I asked uh, Andy Bremer yesterday, and he said, well, maybe we ought to take, have every bank uh, take, when they have an application for a loan, that they preserve that record of application and they forward those applications once a year to the Secretary of the Treasury and that we can examine those and see where credit had been refused. And where it had been refused because of discrimination or uh, unreally, unjustifiably, maybe we could do something uh, to prevail upon those people who have charters to do something about it while they have their charter. Uh, now, now I, don't, I don't know. That involves a lot of records and a lot of things, and I don't know whether that's right or not. But that's what you ought to know, and you ought to find out. Uh, when we talk about black scholarships, I've met with Dr. Spur here, and Ms. Johnson's on the Board of Regents. And we're going out and try to get the money to go into all these schools to say to black boys and girls and, and brown boys and girls in school, you haven't had a fair shake the dice. doesn't do you any good to be able to go to all this, these fine schools. You haven't got the money, but we'll fix your scholarship and try to equalize things. There's so many things down the road that we must do. So organize. I've... I've uh, had uh, the best lobbyist in the world hang on to my arm and try to twist it. But there's none of them I'd rate any better than somewhere on that front row. <laughs> and uh, you can see in a meeting how they reason. So let's go back to that biblical adage that I've referred to so often. Let's try to get our folks reasoning together. And uh, reasoning with the Congress, with the Cabinet, we got a lot of new members, with the leadership, and with the President.
There's not a thing in the world wrong. Matter of fact, there's everything right about a group saying, Mr. President, we would like for you to set aside an hour to let us talk. And uh, you don't need to start off by saying he's terrible, because he doesn't think he's terrible. <laughs> uh, none of us did, although we might have been. But start off talking about how you believe that he wants to do what's right, and you believe this is right. And uh, you would be surprised how many men uh, who really want to do what's right will try to help you. And while I can't provide much uh, uh, go go at this period of my life. I can provide a lot of hope and dream and encouragement, and I'll sell a few wormy calves now and then and contribute. <laughs> and let's let's watch what's been done and see that it's preserved. But let's just say we have just begun. We're just starting, and let's go on until every boy and girl born into this land, whatever state, to whatever color, can stand on the same level ground. Our job will not be done.